Galatians 5, verse 16 and 26. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, I'll tell you, people have been asking me why I changed up the order of the gifts of the Spirit. And the answer is, I don't know. No, I really don't. I have a, I have a saying that, that some of you have heard, but as the father of sons and daughters and as a pastor and just an observer of all things family and social and everything, I, I've come to the conclusion that raising sons is easier than raising girls, and it's because boys are just dumb. <laughs> and if you ask them why they do something, their answer is, I don't know, because they really don't know. I, being a boy of an older sort, have no idea why I put these in the order that I did. But today we're doing self-control. No offense, boys. I are one, and I understand. So... Paul's words highlight that there's this opposition between the desires of the flesh and the spirit and that they're at odds with each other on purpose, that the spirit is designed to, uh, the design of the spirit is to keep you from doing what you want to do. Can we just think about what that means for a second? Paul is saying that you shouldn't do certain things that you want to do. Okay, now I want to really unpack that as we go along because there's going to be some heavy theology in this uh, message and, and these things that we're going to study together because, because this whole fruit of the spirit message of Paul, it's his life theme. It really is. It's, it's all over everything that Paul has written. And what he says then is that the works of the flesh are evident. They're self-evident. That You can tell that your flesh is bearing fruit of a certain kind, and you can tell that your spirit or the spirit living in you, the Holy Spirit living in you, bears a certain sort of fruit as well. And so it's really been, for me, this has been one of the most uh, uh, groundbreaking comprehensions, I, most important things I've understood in my Christian living, is that you can generally judge about anything by the fruit it bears, I generally find that the fruit I see coming from certain people tells me more about them than the words that come out of their mouth or the things that they prefer for me to see. But if you look at the fruit, you get a better sense of what's growing within. And that's what Paul's driving at here. The fruit of the flesh is sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I mean, he's saying, if you want to know what the fruit of the flesh looks like, here's a list. And if you see that growing on the person, let's say, the, the plant, you've seen what is being cultivated and nurtured. 
Now, in the same way, the spirit is here to stop you from doing those things that seem to come very naturally to you. And the spirit is there to help you bear fruit of a different kind. And you'll know if that fruit is evident by the things that you see. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So it's a little redundant, but it's very important that we understand that what we're driving at is is that there is a nature within us that naturally bears the fruit of the flesh. And there's this natural desire to fulfill the fruit of the flesh and to embrace new life in Christ, to be born again in the Holy Spirit is to be enabled to bear fruit of a different kind. And that is exactly what you need to do. And yet, if it depends on you, you will fail. So you might remember we talked last time about how there was a way of reconciling with God for the fruit of the flesh that you bore, and that was to compensate by making sacrifices Interestingly, sacrifices that you accumulate through the work of the flesh. And so we have a tendency to think that as long as we uh, and enter into this sort of quid pro quo relationship with God, that everything's okay. I'm going to feed my flesh and I'm going to bear the fruit of the flesh all week long. And then on Sunday morning, I'm going to sacrifice to God for a little while and that, that's going to square it. Well, that would be the old covenant of the law. That would be the Old Testament way of looking at things. But Paul's introduced you to a whole new covenant in Jesus Christ that says it has nothing to do with what you do. It has everything to do with what the Spirit does through you and in you. And that is the sign that you are now living under the new covenant. So let's just look at this for a second. Because it sounds like what Paul is saying is is that we're pretty much hopelessly devoted to our flesh and to worldliness without the power of the Holy Spirit. And he lists this one particular gift or fruit of the Spirit, which is self-control, which means that you don't really have any self-control without the help of the Spirit. That's what he's implying, not so subtly. And it means that if you are exercising self-control in the flesh, that's admirable to people of the flesh, but it doesn't really carry any weight with God. Because that's really just you disciplining your own flesh for your own sake, to your own ends. So the self-control that comes from the Holy Spirit is unique. It's a different kind of self-control. And the video that Sarah showed really emphasized that pretty nicely, you know, that it's a special kind of self-control that comes from the Holy Spirit. But before we can understand where we go with this, we need to take a look at this list of Paul's that tells us what the fruit of the flesh is. This won't be fun for us, but we've got to look at this because the problem that he's addressing in Galatians is the Judaizers are the ones who want to add this sort of human uh, oversight to the spiritual journey. In other words, they're legalistic They're Judaizers. They want to say that as long as you get the approval of other people, as long as you live according to a set of standards established by people, that makes you right with God. And that's a very legalistic Judaizer view. And what what you can't see in this list is uh, how people have twisted that and turned it into the old covenant law unless you really pay attention. So we need to look at what these things mean. For example, he says sexual immorality. Now I've researched this for you, so I'm telling you what Paul probably meant by these words when he wrote them in the original language. Sexual immorality refers to sex outside of marriage, plain and simple. Impurity refers to contamination like that 
which occurred in the garden when Adam was once pure in the eyes of God and, and able to walk with God in the cool of the evening, as I'm fond of saying. And then he became infected. He, be, he lost his purity. Sensuality refers to eroticism or basically anything that stimulates the immoral use of our sexual nature. Idolatry refers to giving more importance to earthly things than to the Lord. Sorcery refers to witchcraft and magic arts. En enmity is uh, bitterness or opposition or just a, a spirit of antagonism. You know, just can't help stir in the pot. Strife refers to troublemaking and undermining and deceit. It's a lot like enmity. Jealousy refers to grudges and resentment in this case. You're carrying a grudge and you won't let it go. Fits of anger refers to violence, both verbal and physical. There's a lot of people that aren't particularly violent physically, but they are very violent in the things that they say. And they do others harm with words. It's never been easier than it is now. Rivalries refers to ongoing disputes and unhealthy competition. Unhealthy competition. Dissensions refers to the spirit of uncooperation. And in other words, you're not a team player and you don't have any intention of being a team player. Divisions is like that. It refers to intentionally inciting revolt within groups. In other words, not only do you not want to play on the team, but you don't want the team to function. Envy refers to a belief that other people have what they don't deserve and that somehow they're responsible for you not getting what you deserve. Drunkenness refers to intoxicating or poisoning of the mind. Poisoning of the mind. Focus on that when you think about drunkenness rather than the use of drugs and alcohol. How do you poison your mind? That's drunkenness. Orgies refers to binging. That's really how the word is, in, is intended in this case. It's a period of excessive overconsumption. So there, there's the list of the fruit of the flesh. And if I'm not mistaken, I'm betting that this has been a sobering experience for all of us. It was when I wrote it. It was when I thought it through. Because it turns out we all bear the fruit of the flesh. Every one of us. And it comes so naturally it should frighten us. How easily we bear the fruit of the flesh. Now, in a minute, I'm going to show you why that happened and, and what we can do about it. But let's stop again and look at the list from the Judaizers' point of view, because Judaizers want you to think that you must stop doing all of these things in order to be right with God. And they think that it's their job to somehow police everybody else while they're trying to maintain these standards. And certainly we all want to try to live pious and upright lives, if only so that we don't bring discredit to our Lord. But in principle, what this list is, is a, it's a list of, of symptoms that you are more, in, in, you're, you're more involved in your flesh than you thought you were. You are less fruitful in the spirit than you would like to be. And so if you see these things in yourself, and by golly, don't, don't, the first thing you need to do in order to open yourself to the fruit of the spirit is to don't judge anybody. Just stick to your own, your own self, you know? Don't, don't look at anybody else in the room. Don't think about anybody else when you read this list. Just think of you. Have I born this fruit? And if so, what can I do about it? Now, I want to read to you from Genesis chapter 1. You can read along with me if you want. Um, 
You know, I forgot to give you the page number for that Galatians reading, and I don't have to give you the page number for the Genesis reading, because guess what? Just turn over the front cover of your Bible, flip a few pages, and you're going to do it just fine without a page number, because it turns out this reading is right at the beginning of the book. Now, here's what it says. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the every living thing that moves on the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. And you shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and morning on the sixth day. It was very good. Now, here's another thing to keep in mind. These first human beings made in the image of God had no sense of their own flesh at all. They weren't thinking about themselves at all, not the way we do. And this is what is meant by the statement that they were naked. You know, it's fun and, and cute when, when we do the little flannel graphs in, in children's church or whatever, and, and Adam and Eve are hiding behind fig trees or whatever. But the, this is more metaphorical than anything, because what it means is they were not conscious of themselves in the way that sin makes you conscious of yourself. And so they were naked. They, they didn't care. All they did was live for this harmonious relationship with God and everything God had created for them. But here's, here's what happened. And I want to thank Adrian for helping me because I was, I was giving her the premise of the sermon the other day as she was preparing for her work with our young people. And she reflected on what I was saying and gave me some insights that really enhanced the sermon for me because it dawned on me that Jesus spoke of what happened in the garden through a story that he told. And you might remember this story um, if you turn to the Gospel of Matthew. You'll see where I'm going with this in Matthew chapter 13. Now, Jesus told the story of the parable or a parable of, of the sower or the one who threw seed on various kinds of ground. And then after he told the story, the apostles asked him to explain it. And this is his explanation. Jesus said, hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in the heart and does not understand it. The evil one comes and snatches away, excuse me, uh, then this is what is sown along the path. And so as for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it, yet he has not, uh, has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation and persecution arise on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but uh, the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of the riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. And for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears the fruit and yields it. Now, this is the part I really want you to hear, okay? He tells this parable of the weeds, and I want you to think about what happens in the Garden of Eden. Everything was good. They were naked and fine with that because they weren't obsessed with themselves. And then Jesus tells what happened in the Garden of Eden. Get this garden image in your mind. You're all, many of you, planting gardens right now. They're getting ready to put a really cool garden down here at the end of the building. And, and, and here's, here's what happens, all right? This is why you bear fruit that you don't want to bear. This is why. 
Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. And so when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Then how does it have weeds? And he said to them, the enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest and the harvest time then we will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. So Jesus describes in that parable exactly what happened in Eden. Everything was good, and then the enemy came and threw weed seed. And before you know it, Adam and Eve are more conscious than they were before of their nakedness. They're thinking about their flesh now. They're starting to question the goodness of God's creation and the goodness of God. Because now weeds are growing in the Garden of Eden. And God says, well, then we can't have weeds in the perfect garden. We can't have that. And so... Out they go. And now you, as a fallen human, sons and daughters of Adam, you have weed seed as part of your nature. And the weeds you grow look like that list that we just reviewed. And they come naturally. And there's only one way you can deal with it. Are you ready for this? Remember when Barney Fife was here? You know what he would have said? Nip it in the bud. Nip it, nip it, nip it in the bud. It's only funny if you've watched Barney Fife and the Andy Griffith Show. So how do you get control over the weeds so you can stop growing the fruit of the flesh? Well, you need help because you can't. Do it. So you accept Christ as your Savior. You repent of your sin. The first thing you have to do is you got to say, God, I don't want the weed in my garden anymore. The first thing you have to do is stop desiring what you have naturally desired, which is the fruit of the flesh. And you say, well, how do I stop desiring that? Well, the first thing you have to do is recognize that it's undesirable. Okay? I mean, like the first thing you have to do is recognize that it's not desirable. That you want it, but when it's all said and done, it's not really a good thing to want. Because if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting what you're getting. And what you're getting is a life devoted to the flesh that is never satisfying and that is naturally self-destructive. And in the process of self-destruction, you bring destruction around with you wherever you go, even to the people you love most dearly. I can't help noticing a dad holding his little baby over there. And I'm telling you, do you want to bring destruction into your home? Do you want to bring those kinds of things into your home? Of course you don't. And so the first thing you recognize is that you don't want the fruit of the flesh anymore. But you have to be honest and admit that you still crave it. And you have to admit that you can't help craving it. And that means you need help of a different kind. You need help from above. You need more power than you've got. And this is the process of surrender and repentance. This is the process that takes you to the throne of God's grace and causes you to ask for forgiveness and power to overcome. That's the moment. When your soul is transformed. 
Here's the good news and the bad news. When you accept Christ as your Savior and you ask for new birth in the Holy Spirit, you get it instantaneously. Unfortunately, it is in the garden of your flesh. And so now you're trying to grow fruit of the Spirit in your weed garden. You're trying to grow the fruit of the Spirit in your weed garden. And don't worry, the God of creation is tending that garden with you. So you have to recognize when you are cultivating the weeds instead of the fruit of the Spirit. And when you recognize that, you nip it in the bud. And you say to yourself, I don't think the pruning shears I'm equipped with will cut this thing. And that's when you say to the Lord, help me. Help me. You say to the Lord, I know we got to cut this before it turns into fruit of the flesh, but I'm not strong enough to close the tool and cut it off. And so as a guy who just spent some time babysitting his year and a half old granddaughter, I can tell you there's nothing like helping them. It's the joy, isn't it? To just hear, let me help you with that. So she had this chair that was turned a certain way and she wanted to turn it around so she could face me. And she was trying to do it without putting down something she had in her hand. And I said, okay, well, let's do this together. And so together we turned the chair. It's a little thing. But it's a perfect analogy for what I'm talking about here. If we want to cut off the fruit of the flesh before it grows and overtakes the good things, we have to ask the Lord to help us cut it off. So the last thing I want to share with you, and and I realize our service is a little longer than usual today, uh, but we're feeding you lunch, so it's going to be okay. Ted's making hamburgers and hot dogs. May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and I have a particular passion about this topic that I will flesh out more in the next few weeks, but I want you to hear something we've talked about the spiritual matter of true repentance, true surrender, and really embracing the power and the nature of God in you, which is the Holy Spirit. But our bodies, our bodies are weak. You know, Jesus said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He understands that not only is the flesh weak, but sometimes the flesh is defective. Sometimes it's damaged. Sometimes it's sick. It's just not healthy. And we think nothing in the church of praying for someone who was injured or who uh, contracted an illness of some kind or disease. We think nothing of someone even succumbing to a disease. We think nothing in the sense that we just, without hesitation, uplift those people and pray for them and encourage them. But when we see people fighting mental illness, we don't know what to do. And we don't know how to interpret it against our paradigm of overcoming sin and so forth. So we're going to talk about that in the next few weeks. So this is a teaser. We'll talk about that even as we examine the Spirit's work in us and the fruit that that bears. But understand now that there are things that go along with being in a fallen state, even though our spirits have been made new, that include mental illness. And by that, I mean sickness. Everything from a mental toothache to a mental disease that might end in death. And Christ is well aware of all of that, too. And so you who are healthy, 
don't need a doctor, Jesus said, but if you're sick, come to me. And it turns out we're all sick with sin and some of us are sick with more than that, but he's ready to take you at whatever place he finds you. Just ask the woman at the well in Samaria. Let us pray. Almighty God, thank you for your word. Now burn it upon our hearts. Give us the power that comes from your Holy Spirit so that our self-control is a spiritual gift. And examples of our self-control and spiritual fruit would be a sign of your work in us that glorifies you and makes us unconcerned about our flesh, we pray. Amen. Amen.